It's Joe Partavilla back with a new episode of the Forbes Books Podcast. And as companies across the country embrace a work from home life in a post COVID world, many business leaders struggle with the question how do I maintain company culture remotely? And the thing is, most great companies know that company culture plays a major role in how great they can be. Joining me this week is David Freeman. David is the founder and CEO of High Performing Culture, where he helps companies and organizations build positive company culture. He's also the author of a couple books, including Culture by Design, the definitive how-to manual for building a high-performance culture. Hello, David. Great to get a chance to talk with you, Joe. David, it's been too long. And, and you know, uh, let's start by talking about corporate culture, because this is sort of one of your, uh, for lack of a better word, it's in your wheelhouse. And talk to me about corporate culture pre and post pandemic, because I feel there's been a shift in the corporate culture landscape because we were so used to seeing everybody. And then all of a sudden we're used to seeing everyone on a screen. So how has corporate culture shifted over the last year and a half? I'd say there's a couple of things there, Joe. First thing to understand for your listeners is that culture affects every single thing that happens in an organization from your ability to recruit and retain the right people to how those people perform to how much money you make to your competitive advantage. I mean, it affects everything. And so when we understand that, then leaders ought to be as systematic about creating that culture as they can be. Hmm. Now, having said that, let's go to your question about, so how is that different to be systematic about that pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic? And the first thing I would say is that there was a dynamic that took place. I'm gonna go pre-pandemic for a moment here. There was a dynamic that took place in organizations forever. And that was that when a company is small and they, you know, they just start up and they got five or 10 people or whatever it is, typically they're not that systematic about culture, but they have a good culture just because they've got a good leader, a good founder, and he or she, just by being a good person and being around their people every day, they set a good example and everybody figures, be like Joe. <laughs> you know, Joe's the CEO, be like him and you know, everything will take care of itself. And that was, you know, that may not be the best way to do it, but it was sufficient. Mm-hmm. And then what happens is as companies grow and they go from five or 10 people to now they have 20 or 30 or 40 or 50, or maybe they open up another location or maybe they make an acquisition or two, all of a sudden Joe, the CEO, isn't seeing everybody every day. And so we can't rely on just your example being enough because there's just too many people now. You're not touching them every day. Well, and and then the companies really have to start to be more systematic. Well, the pandemic forced that dynamic on everybody. Because whether the company was small, medium, or large, if they were relying previously on physical proximity to be the primary way in which people picked up the vibe, the the way that we do things around here, the culture, if it was mostly picked up just by people being around each other in physical proximity, well, all of a sudden, everybody went home and started working remotely, (laughs) and that wasn't sufficient anymore. And so unless you had a way that you could be more systematic, more process oriented about your culture, all of a sudden, all those people that had good cultures before, now they're worried about how do I, you know, how do I keep from losing that yeah. now that my people aren't together anymore? And that's really the biggest change that the, that the pandemic forced upon us is we have to be more systematic because we can't get away with just hoping that people are going to see each other and pick it up. Hmm. And, you know, it's it's sort of like what phrase I always remember from my improv days, you know, show, don't tell. And you wrote in your book, Culture by Design, that it's simply not posting the vision and mission. It's about what you and your leadership team are teaching your people day after day after day. And so it's it goes beyond just that poster in the lobby or uh, or T-shirts and cups that say the company motto. And I think that's probably, I guess, one of the things that it's hard because first it's like trying to create this vision and mission, and then executing it. A lot of people don't have the skill set to do that, David, do they? It's, it's not something that you can probably go to school for. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. And, and I would say, Joe, uh, even to take a step further back, I would say that most leaders haven't even thought about being more systematic about it. So, you know, you asked the question, do, do people have the, you know, the skill set yeah. to do it? For most, it hasn't even occurred to them that they, th- that they should think about culture in that way. There's a, an exercise I do in the workshops that I sometimes do in workshops with CEOs, and it's very telling. And I'll have a group of CEOs, and I'll say to them, all right, on a one to five scale, 
Tell me, how would you rate culture in terms of its impact on the bottom line? With one being, it's not that big a deal, five being, no, it has a real significant impact on the bottom line. And I go around the room, where do you think, Joe, most CEOs would rate it? Are they down the middle, like three? Actually, believe it or not, in my experience, most give it a four or five. Really? Um, and, and they get, and, and, and then this is different today than it would have been five or 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. So today, people get that culture is really important. But then here's the really interesting thing. So most of them will give it a five. They'll tell me it's, it's one of the most important things in their company. In fact, just as a side comment, sometimes I'll start a workshop and I'll say to the, the leaders who are typically CEOs in the room, I'll say, all right, let's just be honest. Let's cut through the crap. Let's just be honest with each other. Is this culture stuff a bunch of fluff or does this really matter? And you should hear how passionate these leaders get about telling me that it's one of the most important things in their company. So they get that it's important, but here's the really interesting thing. So I'll say, all right, so how many of you in this room right now, and your listeners can do this in their own heads, how many of you in this room right now have some kind of a, a written strategic plan that identifies your most important priorities that you need to accomplish as a company this year? And most of them will raise their hand, almost all of them. Hmm. And then I'll ask them, how many of you have some sort of a, Oh, a sales plan that identifies this year's targets and quotas and goals. How are you going to hit your, you know, your sales and revenue numbers? And most of them have that. And I'll say to them, so I'm assuming that everybody here has a, a financial plan. We're not running our company without a, a budget or a forecast of some sort. And obviously they all have that. And then I ask them, as you might imagine, all right, so how many people have some kind of a written documented culture plan, a process for how you're driving your culture? Almost nobody. No. And I'll say, so let me just get this right. You just told me this was a five in terms of its <laughs> impact on the bottom line. I and mean, we're not talking about fluff. We're talking about making money. And nobody's got a plan? Like, that seems, that would be like running our company with no financial plan. And, and most people kind of, you know, you're right. I hadn't really thought about it. And then I'll ask them, so why don't we have a plan? And this goes to your original question. Most haven't thought about it that way. They think of culture as this soft, fluffy, touchy-feely thing. We're just going to sprinkle pixie dust on our people and we'll somehow magically have a good culture. Or they think of culture as, you know, bringing your dog to work every day or having pizza on Fridays and snacks in the lunchroom as that's culture. And as long as we think of culture that way, like it doesn't even make sense to talk about a process. But if we understand that our culture is probably the single biggest lever that we can pull that impacts more aspects of our business than any other than any other lever we can pull, well then shoot, that's not something you just want to leave to chance. That's something you got to be systematic about. And most leaders haven't thought about that. And the reality to your question about, you know, well, do they have the skills to do it? It's actually pretty darn simple to do. It's not hard to do. It's just that most people haven't thought about it that way. And I'm just curious. I don't, I don't want to make this about age, but have, did you notice sure. that when you do this, is it a generational thing? Do uh, older generations don't get it as well as young or vice versa? No, no. no. Um, I, it, interestingly, I would say the younger workforce, for those entering the workforce, I would say for them, culture is even more important than it was for a generation before. Mm. But from a leadership perspective, most of the CEOs that I end up speaking to, the vast majority tend to be baby, baby boomers. Okay. There's a whole lot of founders of companies, entrepreneurs who started their companies, and they're now you know, 60, 65, 68. And you ask those people if culture is important, and most of them will say, you bet it is. Mm -hmm. I think a, a, a one generation above that, their parents didn't think it was that critical because mm. um, you just work hard and you don't speak up and you, you put your head down, you work hard and you get the job done. You take care of your customers and everything will take care of itself. We don't need this culture stuff. <laughs> but the, I would say the generation that's running, that's most CEOs today, even the older generation of CEOs, they get this is really important. And you talk about this a lot and it's the name of your company, but what do you mean by the phrase high performing culture? How do you define that? So first of all, a culture to me is the set of behaviors that are the norms in how people operate in a given setting. Mm. Um, so we operate differently when we're with our friends from high school than we do with our friends at church than we do at work. Um, and so the, the behaviors that dictate how things happen in this group of people, to me, that's really what the culture is. 
And so in a high performing culture, people are achieving at the highest level that they are, whatever that organization may be. If it's a business entity, it doesn't always have to be. It could be a sports team or a family or any other kind of group of people. But if it's a business entity, the, the company is working incredibly well together. They're seamless in their teamwork. They're performing way better in terms of how they deliver services or products to customers. They're more profitable. They win more business in their marketplace. They're able to attract better people because people see what's going on there and they say they want to be a part of that. So that's what it looks like to be high performing. And just to make this easier for listeners to understand, just picture, let's take it out of business for a moment. Any of our listeners who've ever been part of a high achieving group of people. So maybe think about your, your upbringing. Maybe it was a sports team that you were on in high school or college or even little league, or maybe it was a dance troupe or a band or an orchestra. And you know, you were just known as the best in your whole area. Right. If you, if you picture that, that high performing team, people join that team. If you, let's say it was a, an orchestra yeah. and it was the highest performing orchestra. They're always winning, you know, the all state awards and everything else. And you join that orchestra, you immediately pick up a vibe or an expectation that, you know what, we do things at a certain level here. And it causes people that join that team to elevate their game beyond what they might somewhere else. So you join that football team that wins the state championship every year. And there's just an expectation about the way we do things here. And those expectations, that culture that's created in that high performing environment affects everybody that's on the team. It causes people to elevate their game. And I'm just curious how things are going in terms of you, you talked about uh, retaining talent and I feel again, I haven't done, you're the expert in this, but I feel like a lot of, of, especially maybe millennials and Gen Zers, it's a more of a mobile generation. You see people uh, working at a job a year or two, then going to another job. Whereas yes. me being a Gen Xer, you know, you get out of college, like, okay, what's the job I'm going to do for the next 25 years? So how do you toe that line between a mobile workforce where they're they're at that company for a year or two and keeping that company culture consistent? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, first thing I would say, Joe, is that the culture isn't necessarily, well, it shouldn't be dependent upon those few people in your company who may be the way you want them to be. That if we as leaders are designing, you know, my book's called Culture by Design. If we as leaders are designing the culture that we want to have and we're defining the behaviors that that when our people do these behaviors, that's what makes this a, a high performing organization, a high performing culture, then whoever comes into that culture picks up on those expectations because we're teaching them in a consistent, methodical kind of way. Whoever joins that team picks up the understanding that this is the way we do things here. So if some of those team members decide to be more mobile and are only here for a year and they leave and they go somewhere else, well, that doesn't really affect our culture. I mean, we'd, I'd rather have them stay. And in fact, if we've got a great culture, it may cause them to stay. But let's assume that they leave. The culture didn't go out the door with them because the culture wasn't being dictated by them. Mm -hmm. The culture was being, was being organized and promulgated by the leadership and taught in a systematic, methodical way. So once again, the culture shouldn't be dependent upon a few people in the organization. It's the leadership that's defining that and driving it. You know, there's something that I, I often talk about, and I think it's relevant here, and that is that if we don't create the culture purposely, let's say as a leader, we just, we don't drive it. It's getting created anyway. It's not mm. like it's not happening. It's getting created, and it's going to get created mostly influenced by those people in the company who just happen to have the strongest personalities. So think about, I'll again, take this outside of business for a moment, and then I'll bring it back. Think about a group of friends of yours. You got some buddies, Joe, I'm sure, that you like to hang out with and do things with. And in that group of your buddies, there is a culture in that group. There's a way that you guys know that, you know, we, we don't joke about these things or, you know, we push each other in this way or we tease each other in that way. There's just norms for how they develop. Well, in a group of friends or any group of people, typically, you know, you didn't, I'm sure you and your friends probably didn't do a retreat and come up with a vision and a mission and a set of core values, right? Not recently, no. Not recently. No. But yet there's a, yet there's a, there's a culture in the, in the yeah. group. 
And the culture is most of the time being influenced by some people in your group of friends who just happen to have stronger personalities. They're more influential people, the alpha people. They're the ones that were trying to decide what time to meet for dinner. And one of your buddies says, how about that? You guys want to meet at six? Does that work? And we're like, who said six? You know, somebody <laughs> stepped up and said, how about we do this? And these people are influencing the norms of the group. Well, the reason I, I always point this out is that if we're not doing something about it in our company, in other words, if we're not purposely creating the culture in our company, it gets created in the same way that it gets created in your buddies. That there are some people in the company who just happen to have more influential personalities than other people. And these people aren't, by the way, necessarily the designated managers, supervisors, and leaders. They're just the people who coincidentally happen to have strong personalities. And if those people happen to be really positive, enthusiastic, hardworking, quality-oriented kind of people, well, shoot, this will be great. Everything's going to work out fine. But what if they're not? What if some of those people with strong personalities happen to be cynical jerks with lousy attitudes? Well, those jerks are going to influence the people around them to be more like them. And the reason that I raise this, of course, is if we understand how important our culture is to the success and the performance of our organization, that's not something I want to leave to the whims of whoever happened to be the strongest personalities. That's something, this is my recurring theme, of course, that we have to be intentional about. So to go back to your question about, you know, the, 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 the generation, the younger generation that's more mobile and how does that affect our culture? Well, if our culture was dependent upon the strong personalities of some of those people, then, you know, if those people leave, it's gonna significantly affect the culture. If our culture, however, was was created by design and intentionally driven and taught in a systematic methodical kind of way then once again i'd love for those people to stay but if they leave all right fine well you know it doesn't change our culture because the large culture is not being driven by those couple of people hmm. and so if there's a company that has this turnover and not for any other reason than folks like to just pop around how sure. important does it uh, put the onus on your talent acquisition team and your HR people in hiring and getting people that are going to be a fit relatively instantly? Well, I, I, think, I think it's always critical to do that, Joe, that your talent acquisition team, whatever that looks like, whoever's doing the bringing people in, we've got to make sure that we're bringing in people who are going to be a fit for the culture that we're trying to build here. And that would be just as true whether these people are more mobile or they're not more mobile, yeah. that you're never going to build a team, a high performing team with people who don't fit. You know, I, I sometimes say it this way that, you know, when people come to a workforce and they, you know, you're an employer and they show up at your door to be interviewed or hopefully hired, um, they're already, I like to call them fully baked. In other words, they are who they are. Their, their value system, how they, their perspective on the world, the way, the lens through which they look at the world, most of that is largely complete by the time they show up at your door. Hmm. Um, it came typically from their family, their upbringing, but you're not going to do a lot to change people who aren't a good fit in your culture and like do some kind of magical intervention to convert <laughs> them into becoming a good fit. It, it rarely, it, it's possible. I always say it works about two out of every hundred times. These are really lousy odds. So we've got to be good at picking people who are going to be a fit and quickly, to your point, quickly going to be a fit for the culture that we're trying to create because we're never going to build a really high quality team without that. In your book, uh, Culture by Design, you have eight simple steps to drive better individual and organizational performance. And I don't want to go through every step, but one of them that jumped out of me was number two, and it was ritualize. And I was like, yes. that sounds very spiritual. Uh, talk to me about that step. Yeah, it's, 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 it is. It's a critical step. And yet, um, I don't necessarily mean it in a spiritual way. It's really much more mundane than that, <laughs> but, it, but incredibly powerful. And so uh, let me just very briefly say that the first, I always say the first two steps really drive most of the impact. I mean, there are eight things that are important, mm -hmm. but two of them really drive the biggest impact. The first step is defining with enough clarity what we want the culture to be. And we've been kind of talking about yeah. that, but let me just briefly say that I teach people to define the behaviors that you want to see people doing in your company 
as opposed to the traditional thinking about identifying your typical set of core values. Values tend to be very abstract ideas, and so they're very hard to operationalize. Behaviors are actions. They're things you can see people doing, and so they're easier to operationalize. So just to give you a quick example, behaviors are things like honor commitments, practice blameless problem solving, get clear on expectations, be a fanatic about response time. These are things people do. So the first thing we have to do is to, is bring more clarity to our culture by defining the behaviors that when people do these behaviors, they're going to be more successful. And I call those, those behaviors fundamentals because they're fundamental to success. So that's the first step. Now, the second step that you're asking about this ritualizing idea is a really simple, simple idea, but incredibly powerful. So a ritual, the way that I use this word, a ritual is some behavior that we do over and over and over again until it becomes automatic. It's just, it's just what we do. It's part of our routine. So simple examples of rituals are things like you go to a ball game and we start with the national anthem. You wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth. You know, some people before a meal, they say a prayer. These are just routines. They're things that we do that just become part of our, 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 our routines. It's like a habit. Mm. And so the reason that rituals are really so important and so foundational to success is to think about it. Most people and organizations are just groups of people. Most people stink at sticking with things. We're not good at it. We, you know, we start the diet and exercise program that doesn't last. We roll out the program in our company with all the best of intentions, and then it becomes the flavor of the month. We're just not good at sticking with things. When something becomes a ritual, though, it's no longer hard to do. It's just what we do. So you don't struggle, I'm presuming, to, to brush your teeth in the morning. It's not like you're sitting there saying, God, I just don't feel like doing it today, but I probably should do it. It's, not, it's just part of your routine. So once something becomes part of a routine, it's no longer difficult. It's just what we do. So the way we use that simple concept is we take these behaviors that I call fundamentals and we take one fundamental every week and we focus on it through a series of rituals. So week number one, everybody in the company all week long is thinking about working on focusing on fundamental number one. The week after that, everybody's on number two, and the week after that, three, and so on. So a simple example. So you know, what do I really mean by that? Mm-hmm. Here's a, a really simple example of a ritual that, that I do in my company and pretty much all of our clients. Every time we have a meeting in our company, whether it's a project team meeting, a department meeting, a leadership team meeting, if we have a meeting, even a Zoom meeting, if we have a meeting in our company this week, every single one of those meetings, the first agenda item of the meeting is the, fir- the fundamental of the week. And we spend the first three to five minutes talking about it. So my fundamental this week in my company is called share information. It's about learning to think about, okay, I just learned something. Who else would benefit from knowing this? How do I make sure that I'm distributing information instead of holding on to it myself? So every meeting everywhere in my company this week, the first agenda item every single time is we're gonna spend a couple minutes talking about sharing information. What could we do better about it? How could we improve on that? What gets, why don't we sometimes share information, et cetera? So we'll spend three, four minutes, and then we're gonna move on. We don't, we don't wanna take over the meeting, but every meeting all week, we're gonna start with that because it's a ritual. Next week, every meeting we have in our company is gonna start with next week's fundamental, the week after that, the next one, and so on, and we'll keep cycling through them over and over again. So eventually, if we talk about them enough and work on them and think about them, they start to become internalized. So a ritual is, is, a, is a behavior that, we, that becomes automatic, that we do all the time. And when something becomes a ritual, that's what makes it last. Uh, here's an easy way to think of this whole concept. If I reduce this to its simplest element, because I like to make things simple. Please do, especially for this one right here. Exactly. <laughs> this has got to be, yeah, for you especially, Joe. Thank i got to make it extra simple. Thank you. So, you know, I think of it this way. If you want to learn... Anything that you want to learn whether, and really get good at it, whether we're talking about you want to learn to play the piano and be this incredible piano player, or you want to learn to speak another language or be a master cabinet maker, or I always jokingly say anything other than golf, because anybody who's a golfer knows it's just impossible to freaking learn that. But <laughs> anything else that we want to get really good at, I'll ask you, Joe, what do you have to do to get really good at something? I'd say uh, practice. It's like the old joke of how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Yep. 
Exactly. Tons of practice. But here's the question. How many people do you know who love to practice? Uh, not, not many. Not many. No. So that's kind of a problem. So the key to being able to consistently practice is to create rituals. You don't struggle to remember to brush your teeth. You don't struggle to remember to start the, you know, the prayer, the meal with a prayer, or to do the national anthem, or, or lots of other rituals. Once it becomes baked in as a ritual, and, and I use that word almost interchangeably with the word habit. Mm. There's a couple of big bestsellers out there that many of your listeners. I've, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen them on the shelves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The power of habit, yeah. the atomic habits. It's the exact yeah. same concept. Once something becomes a habit it's no longer difficult to do. It's just what we do around here. So the habit or the ritual, I use that word, mm -hmm. the ritual is what's necessary to keep the repetition going because if we don't have the ritual, we're going to get bored, distracted, and quit. The ritual is what keeps it going and the repetition is what's necessary to master something. So if we apply that concept, I mean, it applies to everything, but let's just apply this very directly to culture. I want your listeners yeah. to really understand the applicability of this to culture. Here's what I would tell you. If driving a culture through any organization is really, I mean, let's cut to the chase. It's really nothing fancier or more complicated than getting your people to live and internalize the behaviors that you know drive success. If you're a leader, you know what you want people to do. It's frustrating you can't get them to do it, but you know what you want them to do. Well, they're not going to internalize those behaviors simply because you held a big company meeting one day and you know you announced it to everybody hmm. doesn't mean you shouldn't have one but that's not going to be sufficient they're not going to internalize those because you put posters all over their walls with signs <laughs> about the vision mission and values that doesn't mean you shouldn't by the way but that's not going to get them to internalize it they're not even gonna, they're not even going to internalize it if you put it in their performance reviews hmm. the only way they're going to internalize those behaviors is when you teach it to them over and over and over and over again. It's repetition. And the only way you'll ever keep teaching it with that much repetition without getting bored and distracted and quitting is when you create rituals around it because the rituals are what keep it going. That's why rituals are so foundational to success. It's, it's very pragmatic. Hmm. All right, let me play devil's advocate here. Sure. What if you have these rituals and you've been doing them for a while and you're just an employee who's sort of just Oh God, here we go. We're doing. Oh, Dave's doing this thing again. I got to do this thing at the beginning of the meeting. How how do you stop that from happening? Because I'm sure we've all been there, where there yep. is probably it. Maybe it's not a ritual, but it's a regular part of a meeting where all of a sudden it comes to that part, and everyone's like, "Oh boy, we're doing this yeah. thing again here." <laughs> yeah, that's that's a great. Yeah, you're asking a, a real good question, Joe. And I would say the key to keeping rituals from becoming bored, tired, meaningless, and oh yeah, here we go again, <laughs> is to create, to look for ways to create interactivity or engagement. So let me give you an example using the, the fundamental of the week uh, as the first agenda item of meetings. So if I stand up in the front of the room and I lecture for a couple of minutes about the fundamental and you're in a completely passive role, yeah, eventually it's just going to go in one ear and out the other. All right, when's that guy blowhard yeah. going to shut up? <laughs> but if instead I ask you a question and I say, Joe, so, you know, we're on share information this week. So why do you think that sometimes people hold on to information and don't share it? Now I've asked you a question, a specific person, a question, and, and now you got to, you know, your brain is involved and you're participating and you give me your thoughts and then somebody else adds their thoughts. And now we got a lot of different ideas going and now we have an interactive conversation. Or sometimes I might rotate and say, hey, Joe, at next week's sales meeting, I'd love it if you could lead our discussion of the fundamental of the week. Mm. Now I got you involved instead of you just being in a passive role. So the more we can create engagement, and interaction, the more the ritual becomes meaningful instead of it just becoming, oh yeah, here we go again. And I think making it as specific as possible, like you pointing out, hey, what do you have to share about this topic? Because a lot of folks, um, you know, I remember this came up a lot when people were transitioning from office to virtual, the, the senior leadership were like, wow, people don't seem energetic on the camera. <laughs> people, yes. and, and, it's, and, and, and I remember I stepped in and said something like, 
well, did you ever see how these people look without a camera? They probably look exactly the same, but everything is just so blown up. You see every hair and pimple on the person's <laughs> face. So all of a sudden it looks like, wow, there's a lot of dead-eyed people in there. But essentially they probably look the same in person, but you're just seeing it so close up. So I think that's one of the important takeaways that I think a lot of people – probably have to learn along the way that like, Hey, listen, not everyone is going to be, you know, Martin short on the tonight show, you know, <laughs> you know, on the camera and being effervescent and sharing. Sometimes you have to ask pointed questions to get there. So that r- ritual doesn't become the, Oh boy, here comes Dave again. Yeah. With his ritual. Uh, yeah. So, I, I think, yeah. I think you're right on Joe. And w- what I would add to that is the way I like to position this when I'm coaching leaders about, about starting a meeting with the fundamental of the week is I'll say, if you ask a specific person a specific question, Mm. you get the involvement. So if I throw out to the group at large, so does anybody have anything you wanna say about this? Mm. Crickets, you get nothing. And it it doesn't, by the way, and I think people misinterpret that because when that happens, sometimes the, the person who put that question out will say, oh boy, just, you know, nobody was engaged, nobody was interested. And it, that's not really it. It's just that for whatever reason, it's just human nature. Most people don't volunteer. I mean, think about times where you've been, you, you've, you've got a group of people who say, all right, who's willing to, uh, to, to, you know, to run this program or to volunteer to, to, you know, I don't know, drive the carpool or whatever it is. Right. And no one says anything. And, but then if you call on somebody, hey, Joe, could you take care of that? And, and you'll say, oh, sure, I'd be happy to. It's just people don't volunteer, yeah. but it doesn't mean they're not willing to do it or they don't care or they're not interested. It's just that they don't volunteer. So what you do about that is, again, you ask a specific person a specific question. So I have to, I, I have to call on you and say, Joe, and not just, Joe, do you have anything you want to say about this? But I got to ask you a more specific question, like I, the example I gave you in this particular case, Joe, what do you think keeps us from why do we why do you think sometimes we hold on to information instead of sharing it all right that's a very specific question and i'm asking it to you not to the group at large but to you and now you're going to answer it and then you'll start seeing other people will jump in yeah that reminded me that happened to me yesterday or my buddy really struggles with this and all of a sudden everybody's participating hey dave you know what you're you're good at this you should do this for a living you're a good point. I may not try to do that someday. <laughs> because you make such great points because I've been in these uh, team huddles where it opens up with, anybody have some good news today? And then and it's nobody like, says a thing. nobody says a thing. And yep. and, and if they took the, what you're, you're, you're laying down here, David, it makes perfect sense because I think a lot of people, I think we all do this, we revert automatically to grammar school. When yes. you when you're sitting in the, at the at your desk and you're going through puberty, you you, you feel like your life is falling to pieces, and then all <laughs> of a sudden a teacher op- asks an open ended question to the room, no one in their God's no. name is going to raise their hand to that. Absolutely not. And we you're right, we revert to that. That's how people are. It's all right. So you work with that. You don't misinterpret that because many people again will misinterpret that to mean how come my people don't care? Yeah. Or how that doesn't mean that. That's not what it means. Wonderful. You just got to ask a specific person a specific question. All right, let me ask you a crazy question because sure. you, you've asked good questions. I got a crazy one. Is sure. it possible for a company to succeed with culture that's not high performing or not a positive or not a great culture? Is, is that possible? You know, I, I think it is. Um, I, but not that I want is, people to have cra- crappy cultures, sure. but I'm just curious that it's like, I mean, obviously you see successful companies have great cultures, but we don't always know what's going on behind closed doors. We don't know the blue chip companies of, you know, American Express, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, name them. We may think they have great cultures because they're so, sex- so successful, but we probably don't know. Maybe there's an office in Atlanta and, uh, for Coca-Cola headquarters. are like, man, this job sucks. I don't like being here. So, <laughs> right. uh, I, but then again, those companies are successful. Yeah. So here, I, I would say my point of view about that, this, and this is just my opinion. It's not based on any kind of research, but my point of view about that, Joe, would be that Yes, I think one can be successful in spite of themselves. Okay. But the que- the, but my point of view would be how much more successful would they be if they did the right things? And it's sort of like, I'll give you an analogy. I happen to be a big believer in the importance of being well-organized, that people that are well-organized accomplish more in less time with higher quality and less stress than people that are disorganized. Mm. So if I see somebody and I look at their office and there's just 
piles of paper everywhere and it looks like a complete train wreck, that does not mean that they can't be successful. But how much more successful would they be if they were better organized? It just would raise their game significantly. So I think a company could be successful, but they certainly wouldn't be maximizing their performance. I don't think it's possible to maximize their performance without that. There's a, you know, there's a quote that's in the back of that book, and it's my favorite quote on, on the topic of culture, and it really relates to this. And the quote says, good companies have good cultures by chance, hmm. but world-class companies have world-class cultures by design. And what I mean when I, when I say that quote is that it's very similar to what you're asking about. If you're not intentional about it, if you're, if you're a good leader, let me put it this way, if you're a good leader, this isn't rocket science. You know, you're going to hire good people, you're going to treat them well, not because you read a book one day that said you should treat your people well. Like, you wouldn't know what else, what else to do. You're a good guy, you're a good yeah. woman. And so you'll treat people well, and you'll have a decent culture, and you'll be reasonably successful. And I, I often say that the things that I teach and work with companies on actually isn't the difference between success and failure. It's not. I mean, how could I claim it is? Because there have been lots of people that have been successful and they're not doing what I teach. So <laughs> I can't be the difference. Uh, it'd be a lot of hubris of me to assume it is. But what I would say is, it's not the difference between being successful and failing. It's the difference between being successful and being extraordinary, because that's an entirely different game. Hmm. That while good companies have good cultures by chance, the best companies, the amazing companies, absolutely understand how important their culture is. And, and what a driver of performance it is. And they don't leave any of it to chance. It's just too important. Instead, they're incredibly intentional and purposeful and systematic about every aspect of how they create and deploy and build their culture. Hmm. There isn't any of it that's left to chance. So, you know, you can be, you can do okay without being systematic about it. You're not going to be extraordinary. And that in spite of thing make, always makes me think of like uh, Steve Jobs at Apple, who famously was just uh, uh, an a-hole, for lack of a better word. And yep. yet he created a culture of people who just strove to succeed and break ground and become revolutionary. So they, they so he created an incredible culture in spite of the fact his a-holeness. Yep. So yep. It, <laughs> there are examples of it in, in yep. uh, over time. I, well, and I think another, I, I recently listened to the biography of Elon Musk. Okay. And, and I, he's, it, you know, as I listened to it, I thought it was almost identical to Steve Jobs, that it's the same kind of thing, that, that he is just so unbelievably demanding and almost, at least how he's characterized in the book, and I have no reason to think it's not true, but he, he's almost... Um, almost antisocial, like there's yeah. probably some psychological aspect to this. Um, maybe he's, maybe he's got Asperger's syndrome I believe he, or something. Uh, actually, some... recently, David, I believe he did say that he, 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 he has Asperger's, yeah. W wouldn't doubt it, and I wouldn't yeah. doubt that, that, that Stephen Jobs had the same kind of thing. That, like, just an inability to even understand, you know, normal ways of working with humans. <laughs> but on the flip side of that, you know, he just is so relentless in the same way that Apple was about, you know, there's a mission here that we are here to achieve, to do things that have never been done before and drive people to, you know, just to not accept anything short of success. And don't tell me you can't, you know, do a hundred dollar job for $10, just find a way to do it. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not going to accept no. And somehow people do a magical things, but it comes at a high cost. Hmm. Um, yeah. Well, Dave, you've, you've written some great work and uh, obviously you're well read. I'll put you on the spot. Tell me the last best book you've read. Hmm, you're putting me on the spot. Yeah. So what was my last best book? You can't count um, any of the ones you've written. I can't count my own. Don't no. it. You know, one of my favorite books, this it may not be the last one, but it's actually one of my favorite books. Um, Stephen M. R. Covey, oh. um, who's the son of the original Stephen Covey yeah. of Seven Habits fame, wrote a book called The Speed of Trust. And it's a fascinating book because it looks at, he talks about what's called, the, what he calls the trust dividend, that when you create trust in a relationship, in an environment, in a culture, you just get this amazing speed that takes place and effectiveness when trust is present. And then he goes on to 
look at in a more analytic way. So what are the behaviors that drive trust? You know, how do you actually create trust? Hmm. And it's really, a, I think, an outstanding work and a lot to be learned from that. Cool. His name is David Friedman. His book is titled Culture by Design, and I'm sure he's got more of those books uh, kicking around in his head. Uh, David, this has been a pleasure. Hopefully, I didn't ask. Sometimes I get off on tangents and ask really weird questions, so I appreciate you indulging me and answering all (laughs) the goofy things I had to ask. Oh, it's always my pleasure, Joe. Thanks again, David. And that is it for this edition of the Forbes Books Podcast. If you enjoy the show, make sure you take a second and subscribe so you automatically get new shows when they drop. Also, if you have a minute, I would love if you left us a review so more amazing entrepreneurs like yourself can discover the show. And please don't forget the golden rule and treat others as you want to be treated. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Adios. This has been a production of Forbes Books Radio. Find out more at ForbesBooksRadio.com.